this presentation. And Matt, you have control. Great. Thank you, Jameson. Um, let me get my screen up here. Okay. And let's see. Okay. We good? Yes. Great. Great. Uh, well, thanks again for having me. I'm, I'm excited to, um, to talk today. Uh, I, I'm very passionate about what I do, which is investment advisory and, um, and using um, risk management tools within what I do. So, um, so I'm very excited. I also want to thank Palisade for, for hosting this webcast. I've um, presented it at their annual conference for the last few years, and, um, and I enjoy that for a couple of reasons. First, just because it's in Las Vegas, right? So that's a, a nice getaway. And then um, I also like it because as far as speaking engagements go, I don't have to uh, give an outcome or a, a, a forecast. Um, it's a risk management presentation, so um, what I do is is say I'm not sure, and uh, that's that's something that's well understood at that conference uh, versus most media engagements where people want a, a prediction of some sort. So so I enjoy that. Um, this this webcast is uh, very broad, and I'm going to try to keep it um, pretty high level. We'll increase the the technicality of it as we go and actually get into some some models, but still at a high level. Um, mostly because there's a lot of different things that uh, that I do that involves risk management. So I think what um, what I'll do is use this as kind of an initial uh, presentation, and then for people who are very interested, um, can either send me an email or connect with me on on LinkedIn, uh, matt.rosenberg at rosecap.com, or Twitter is uh, rosecapia is my Twitter handle, and then um, I'll do maybe some future presentations where we can increase the um, I guess I'd say the difficulty and, and the detail getting into some of the models uh, and different processes. So um, that said, if there's any questions, uh, I look forward to answering those and, and get as detailed as we want to go. So um, first, let me give the disclaimers. Um, I think the main points here are that nothing in this presentation uh, constitutes investment advice, which we taken as investment advice. Um, all the numbers are, are made up, and, um, and just for illustrative purposes, uh, this isn't a solicitation to buy or sell securities. Any models and methods are, are the property of Rose Cap and shouldn't be replicated uh, without prior written consent. And then um, a lot of the models have limitations, and it's important that those are understood before actually using them. So um, with that said, <clears throat> let me tell a little bit about my firm, uh, Rose Cap. Um, I'm located in Colorado, although I'm registered in, uh, in both states of Colorado and Georgia as a registered investment advisor, um, both CPA and CFA uh, credentials, and um, I'm what you call an independent investment advisor. So I'm not affiliated with any other banks or financial institutions. Um, I'm basically uh, just uh, standalone to provide investment advice for, for clients. Um, I operate on a fee-only compensation structure. So those two points are, are pretty important. I like to, to bring them up in every presentation. Um, the main reason is because as an independent, I don't have any incentive to provide investment advice <clears throat> other than what I think is in the best interest of my clients. Um, I'm not loyal to any product or, or group, and then uh, it's fee only. I just charge a flat fee for my uh, for my services. It's based on the percentage of assets under management usually, um, and then uh, my clients are receiving invoice for that versus the alternative, which is um, receiving or me getting paid off of commissions based on the, the type of product that I, I put my clients in. So um, so those are important points. And then the last is I, I work with uh, TD Ameritrade as a custodian of the assets. Um, that doesn't mean they're uh, a partner or affiliated partner with me. They're just uh, the custodian of the assets, so they hold the stocks and bonds. Again, I like to mention that just because as a small firm, um, people can take comfort in the fact that they're not making a checkout to, to Rose Cap Investment Advisors, who is, who is small. Um, they actually have a large name that is custody in the asset. So um, that's my firm, Rose Cap. I provide uh, three different types of services. The first is um, portfolio management. It's basically just managing the, the investments of clients. Um, financial planning is helping clients understand what are their investment objectives. Um, that can be individuals um, to the use of a financial planning model, which I'll talk a little bit about in this presentation. Um, <clears throat> can also be institutions who are trying to um, gauge appropriate spending levels and that type of stuff. Um, last is have the ability to do qualified retirement plans of so 401ks and um, and so on or similar plans. 
Um, my typical clients are institutional, um, so other investment advisors um, or endowments, foundations, that type of stuff, um, high net worth individuals. Um, typically with more than half a million dollars of investment assets. And then uh, a third category, which could be both one or two, but people who are looking to make investments in we call alternative assets, so private equity, real estate, or even direct investment. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that and how I integrate it into the process um, later on in the presentation as well. So, <clears throat> um, again, this webcast, I just want to keep it high level. Um, I, I don't want to scare too many people off. If there's any questions, um, we can get into more detail. I love talking about what I do. And, um, and then uh, I can host future webcasts, even one-on-one -on -one webcasts for people um, to show them more detail in the models and the processes and stuff like that if there's, if there's interest. So, um, okay, <clears throat> Rosecap, um, my mission, and I put a lot of thought into this mission statement, is to provide clients with the highest probability of achieving their financial goals. And so I highlighted or underlined highest probability <clears throat> on this slide. And I think there's two ways to um, to achieve that. And that's kind of the theme of, I would say, of this presentation is how to achieve the highest probability of achieving your financial goals. Um, the reason I say highest probability is because um, obviously in investments, there's a high degree of uncertainty, um, not just in the legal disclaimers, but that's the truth is, um, most of the time, people don't know what's going to happen in investments. Um, and so rather than try to make, uh, what I say, directional predictions or take a directional bias um, on certain outcomes, I take the approach that the future is uncertain and that we want to find the best way to deal with that uncertainty. So coming up with the highest probability of achieving a financial goal is, is what I try to provide for clients. So Qualitative, there's a qualitative and quantitative ways to do that. Let me discuss the qualitative very quickly, um, and then most of this presentation will be quantitative. Um, first is minif minimizing the fees. So while there is a high degree of uncertainty in investments, uh, one thing that's not uncertain are portfolio fees. Um, you know, say death, taxes, and investment management fees are the three certainties now. We could, we could modify Benjamin Franklin's statement. Um, <clears throat> so a couple ways is, is to, um, I guess, receive direct investment help. Um, a lot of advisors will say, well, my job isn't to select the investments. My job is to uh, select the invest investment managers for a client. Well, that's an extra layer of fees. So to the extent that um, an investor can find the person who's actually going to be doing the investing for them, picking the securities, handling the investments, um, could help limit fees. Also, the use of exchange-traded funds, um, I'm a big believer, can, can reduce the fees significantly to portfolio, um, especially over conventional mutual funds. They're, they're very similar. Um, they just have a lot lower fees. They're passive, so they're not actively managed, but if you follow the, the first step, A, then you're using an active manager to, to handle those ETFs. So there are a couple of good ways to, um, to reduce portfolio fees. Now, I also want to say when you're talking about <clears> – <throat> minimizing fees. I think it's very important. Um, I also don't think I, I would recommend it, or I know I wouldn't recommend it, at the detriment of performance. So in every single industry I can think of, the best get paid the most. Um, doesn't matter if you're a football player or you're a doctor. Um, if somebody's on a gurney going into a surgery, um, they're not going to say, hey, can I, can I have the cheapest doctor? Um, having a good investment manager is um, often well worth paying a higher fee for, so um, something that should be taken into consideration. Um, <clears throat> second qualitative measure is to focus on asset allocation. So um, asset allocation is the combination of stocks, bonds, um, commodities, currencies, we call asset classes that an investor would hold within their portfolio. So the percentage makeup of each of those asset classes um, typically accounts for 85 to 95% of the total portfolio returns. Um, that's a large number. So an analogy I heard last night, which I thought is a good one, is um, <clears throat> if I'm going fishing, I could be the best fisherman in the world. Um, if I go to a, a fish that just, or a lake, I'm sorry, a lake that just doesn't have fish in it, it doesn't matter if I'm the best fisherman. I'm not going to catch anything. Um, if I go to the gold medal waters of uh, southern Colorado, and <clears throat> I'm the worst fisherman in the world, which would be myself. Um, 
I still might get lucky and catch some fish. In fact, I have gotten lucky and caught some fish. Not very many, but a few. So uh, focusing on asset allocation is big over um, what I would say is trying to pick the actual security. So trying to pick the best stocks, the best bonds, I would say it doesn't matter. Figure out how much you're going to um, have in each of those asset classes is much more important. Um, also, it's, it's very difficult to pick the best stocks and bonds. Most people can't do it with consistency. Here's an article I found um, just a couple of days ago that came out, a cat beats the investors in the stock market challenge. So the cat uh, somehow put its paw on a piece of paper and, and picked some stocks and, and it beat most of the investors. And that's not a surprise. They've had monkeys throwing darts and stuff like that. You see stuff like this come out from time to time. So um, <clears throat> I think it just reiterates the point. The, the focus of, um, of an investment professional should really be on the asset allocation. Um, last is, I would say, uh, qualitative is, is to hire um, an investment professional, if you're not doing it yourself, who, who is actually a fiduciary to you. So this is a very important distinction that I think often goes um, unnoticed. Um, the title investment advisor can be very broad, and it's used by a lot of different people. So a registered investment advisor, RIA, is an individual institution who's regulated by the Investment Advisor Act of 1940. What that means is they have to be a fiduciary for their clients. Fiduciary means they have to treat their client assets as if they're their own. Um, they take full responsibility for that. They can't have or they have to disclose the conflicts of interest. Um, <clears throat> not all people who operate under the title investment advisor are RIAs. Um, a lot of those are what we call broker-dealers. A broker-dealer is regulated by FINRA, and they're held to a different standard called a suitability standard. Uh, what that means is they just have to, to recommend investments that are, uh, could be classified as suitable for the person they're selling their, their investment products to. So um, RIAs tend to be uh, um, fee-only and, and working to get the investment client the best um, set of investments possible. Broker dealers tend to be product salesmen um, who, work in, who work for uh, fund companies and stuff like that. So it's important to, to make that distinction. It, obviously, I would make the argument that if you have a fiduciary working for you, um, you're going to have a higher probability of achieving an investment objective than a broker dealer who just has the suitability standard is trying to sell product. Um, last would be to hire the fee only paying advisor again if you're not doing this yourself. Um, <clears throat> fee only is like paying a salary. Um, that's good because now as an investment advisor, I, um, it doesn't matter what happens. I get uh, the same amount of fee. Um, I'm not commissioned, so I have no incentive to uh, put my clients in certain products or others that may, may or may not pay higher commission. Um, so these are the qualitative measures. I think they're very important. And before we get into the, the quantitative stuff, probably what most people are going here, I think this, this uh, definitely deserves mention. Okay, so now highest probability – um, quantitatively. Um, so a lot of people on this call, I said I want to keep it high level, may or may not be um, statisticians. In fact, maybe very few are or uh, even remember anything from their high school or college statistics class. So let me give a quick analogy um, just to relate some of these statistical concepts that, that we'll be using and uh, what a better analogy than golf, right? So golf, um, my objective is going to be to get the ball in the hole um, with the least amount of strokes. So in the spirit of highest probability, what do I need to do? Uh, what do I need to account for to get the ball in the hole with uh, the least number of strokes? So here's my green, uh, the flag in the hole, and obviously you can see the lake off to the left. This is some, uh, some nasty Sunday pin placement, right? So um, if I'm going to hit my shot into this green, I first need to take into consideration uh, my point estimate. Um, in that case, it's the hole. So I'm going to aim at the hole. That's the, the most logical first step, right? Um, I also need to take into consideration you know, my dispersion of potential outcomes. So um, obviously, I'm not going to hit the ball in the hole. Um, I've been playing golf for a long time. I'm not very good, but I've never had a hole in one. And, um, and so I'm going to miss. And the, what I want to understand is by how much am I going to miss? So I, um, when I'm hitting the shot, I want to take into consideration not just aim at the hole, but how much I could potentially miss by. Now, if you look at this dispersion of potential outcomes, the red circle there um, is my potential landing zone. Um, you can see that it's uh, about 60% of that is in the water, right? I'm not a very good golfer. I'm about a 15 handicap. So, um, you know, another qualitative investment advice I should go back a few slides is 
don't hire an investment advisor who's say less than a 10 handicap, right? Um, I'm a 15, so here's my dispersion of, of potential outcomes. Um, with this potential outcomes, I probably don't want to aim right at the hole. The chances are I'm going to hit in the water. So, you know, I probably want to aim somewhere out in the middle of the green, give myself a higher probability of getting in the hole uh, and fewer strokes. Okay, if I'm a better golfer, uh, say Tiger Woods or somebody uh, scratch golfer, <clears throat> you know, maybe I can aim at the hole because now my dispersion of potential outcomes uh, doesn't put as high a probability of the ball going in the water. So understanding that dispersion is, is very important um, as point number two. Um, next is, I'm not a very good golfer. I have a special shot, though. I like to call it the snap hook. So this shot, you can see I'm aiming at the hole, but I could miss to the right, not a whole lot, but there's a whole lot of probability of missing to the left. In fact, the, the outcomes go clear over the lake. Uh, that's something that's happened to me before. I didn't, didn't just hit the ball in the lake. I actually went way over the lake maybe the road on the other side of the lake, you know, hoping I don't hit a car or something like that. So, so here's my snap hook shot. Um, what I want to illustrate here is I can't just take into consideration the dispersion. I want to think about the shape of my dispersion of potential outcomes. So as the third point there, um, <clears throat> that's something I should be considering. Um, last is, I'm going to add to this example, let's say I'm playing in a scramble. So that means I'm a partner. And the two of us are trying to get um, our ball. We get to hit two shots, and we're trying to get it in the hole in the fewest strokes. Um, and I want to think about how to get the highest probability of that. The last variable I would want to include is where's my partner going to hit the ball? Um, if I hit it in the lake, is he going to be likely to hit it in the lake? Or maybe is he going to step up and hit it on the green, uh, do the opposite of what I do? How do we affect each other? And so for that, I want to consider my relationship to others um, <clears throat> as I'm as I'm making my shot. So these are the four, um, what I would say, points that I want to consider when I'm uh, dealing with, with uncertainty from a quantitative standpoint. So let me make these even a little more quantitative, or I guess let's go back to statistics class, but the point estimate is going to be my, uh, what I call my mean or my median or mode. It's a measure of central tendency. Um, I have the dispersion of outcomes. That's measured by standard deviation. Shape of this version is measured by my skew or kurtosis, and then um, the relationship with with uh, potentially other variables is going to be my correlation. So these are the, the variables that I want to consider as I'm trying to uh, give myself the highest probability. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about it in terms of a security now. So here's security ABC. Um, I have my point estimate, or my mean, I will say, is $100 per share. Let's see if I can get a, a tool here to write with on my screen. Okay, so here's my point estimate, $100 a share. Um, my dispersion of potential outcomes is measured by standard deviation. Um, one standard deviation to either side is $20, so you can see I can go from $100 to $120. If I go positive one standard deviation, I can go down to 80. If I go negative one standard deviation, so I have a standard deviation of $20. <clears throat> I could even go two standard deviations, which would carry me down to $60 or would carry me up to $140 of my potential outcomes within two standard deviations of the mean. Um, one point about this is you can see the standard deviations are equal on either side, or the, the, the dollar amounts are equal upside as downside. So one standard deviation carries me up $20, carries me down $20. Um, this is a unique property, and so that would mean this is a normal distribution. The, <clears throat> the um, dispersion of potential outcomes is symmetric across my mean. So you can see this graph looks the same on the left side as it does on the right side. Um, one unique property about it is uh, a normal distribution is that within one standard deviation of the mean plus or minus, I have a 68% probability of occurrence. So um, there's a 68% chance that um, I'm going to have an outcome. So security ABC stock price, let's say at the end of the year, is going to be between $120 and $80. Um, also, with a normal distribution, I could say two standard deviations is equal to 95% confidence interval. So I could say with 95% confidence that <clears throat> I think this security ABC will be priced between $140 and $60 at the end of the year. So um, the point here is that 
the distribution is basically a probability curve. So these distributions, once I've set these parameters, I have what I call a probability curve of expected outcomes for my security. Um, here's another way of looking at it is on the next screen. Um, here's a normal distribution. This is the same parameters. I have a mean of 100, a standard deviation of 20. And now here's my probabilities of different stock prices, right? So at the 95th percentile, $132. At uh, the 5th percentile, $67. And um, this is the probabilities of the potential outcomes for a stock described by um, standard deviation of 20 and a mean of 100. So um, if I want to consider skewer kurtosis, um, now I want to add in those shape components. Um, normal, uh, the skew of a normal distribution is zero, so I didn't show it on the last screen. Here we have skew of 0.5, so you can see it's slightly sloped going out this way to the right on this positive skew, um, and I still have a kurtosis of three, so the, the kurtosis of a normal distribution is three. <clears throat> What's interesting about this is um, you can see my probabilities here. So in the 99th percentile, I have an expected return of 31. 0.23%, I have a downside or 1% of my lowest outcomes is going to be 13.5 uh, negative percent. So there's, let's say there's more upside than downside um, if I have positive skew. The opposite is with a negative skew, I have um, more downside than I do upside. Now it looks this 23 is higher than 21, but that's because my point estimate is 5. So I'm starting from 5. I could go down as low as 21. Uh, could go as high as 23. So I would have more downside than upside. Now, in investment, um, a lot of investment professionals would actually prefer negative skew. The reason why is because at the 50th percentile, you can see I have a 6% return. Um, so expected return of 6% at my 50th percentile. Um, my mean return is 5%. So my 50th percentile is actually higher than the mean. For that reason, a lot of investment professionals like the negative skew, they think the results are going to be somewhere in closer to the mean. If you think results tend to lie in the outliers um, or tend to come in the outliers, you might prefer a positive skew where you have the higher upside and lower downside. Um, you can see, though, with a positive skew, now I have a 50th percentile of 4%, which is actually less than my mean. So um, things that need to be considered. Okay. Um, now we go to um, a couple more. Leptokurtic means that I have higher kurtosis than normal. So uh, the, the kurtosis of a normal distribution is three. This kurtosis is four. So you can see this distribution is slightly more peaked than a normal distribution. A platykurtic distribution means uh, kurtosis is less than three. So here's kurtosis of two. And you can see it's a little bit rounder. It's less peaked. Um, maybe fatter tails, you can say, and a platykurtic distribution. So, so these are the moments of distribution that I want to control as I'm trying to define <clears throat> all my investments. Um, I'd make the argument that every single investment, a stock, bonds, mutual funds, commodities, real estate, all could be described by these probability curves using these, these moments of distribution. So now they may have different shapes. Um, here's some different shapes of probability curves. They might even be what we call discrete. So there's not a continuous range of outcomes, but they're set at intervals. Um, but I would make the argument that every single investment, uh, no matter what it is, could be described by a probability curve of potential outcomes. Um, this is called, uh, in the industry, we call it setting capital market expectations. So for every single security that I would invest in, I would want to have uh, set my capital market expectations. These are basically these moments of distribution of the potential outcomes. Uh, I feel like that is, as an investment advisor, uh, my job that's part of the service I provide to clients. Um, it's very time consuming, but I wouldn't want to put um, clients into a security without understanding what are the potential outcomes or what is this probability curve of potential outcomes. Um, if you don't do this, I'm not sure uh, how else you would pick securities. Take a drink. Okay, there's a little joke. Guy throwing darts, maybe is the other way to pick them. I don't think that's, uh, hopefully this isn't what a lot of people are doing, um, except for the monkeys and the cat and stuff like that. But um, 
what a lot of people do do, I think, is they'll just set the price target. So, okay, the current price of the stock is $75. Um, we do some research. We say we think it's going to be $100. Let's buy it. Um, now, that's okay. I guess it's, it is a capital market expectation, but I think it's missing a very important point, which is the dispersion of the potential outcomes or the shape of dispersion. So, so those things are being missed. Um, I think those are pretty important. Um, back to my golf analogy, very, very seldomly does one actually hit the ball in the hole. So very seldomly in investment, same thing, is the price target actually hit at the uh, at the horizon date. Um, you're, you're almost always missed by some amount, and so accounting for that is very important. The other thing that I think is um, a lot of investment advisors do is they'll say, well, okay, let's just say that if you're um, – if you're investing in stocks, you're risky. Stocks are risky. Um, bonds are safe. And um, if you're over the age of 50 years old, you know we want to shift your allocation towards more bonds. If you're under the age of 50, we, we think you should be in more stocks, taking more risk. So I, I have a lot of problems with that. And that's actually what a lot of these target date funds will do. It's kind of a new trend is they'll say, okay, you're going to retire in 30 years. Let's invest you with mostly stocks now as you get closer to retirement. Um, We'll ship that allocation to more bonds, and you don't ever have to worry about it. We'll just do it for you. Um, but the problem is, is the probability curves of stocks and bonds are always shifting. I wouldn't always make the argument that stocks are riskier than bonds. Um, right now, it might actually be a good uh, a good uh, time where you could say bonds could be riskier than stocks, certain bonds at least. Um, there's not a lot of room for interest rates to go down, something that would help the value of bonds. There's a lot of room for interest rates to go up. Um, interest rates going up um, adversely impacts the price of bonds. So um, I'm, I, I could make the argument that there are probably some bonds out there that are risky or definitely riskier than stocks. Um, <clears throat> so getting away from this line of, of thinking um, is something I really try to do with my approach to portfolio management. So um, now we got, okay, so we've set our, our capital market expectations for, um, for security. Those are the moments of uh, distribution that I, I think should be looked at to uh, when one is setting those for an individual security. So now <clears throat> what I want to talk about is how do we uh, combine these securities into a portfolio? So if I have three securities here, security A, B, and C, um, each one, this has an expected return, a standard deviation, and a, um, uh-oh, let's see. Yeah, I hope that, that miss, my screen messed up a little bit. That's probably just the, the delay. Okay, we have a standard deviation um, of 2.5% and then the weight in the portfolio. So these are the variables I want to consider. Now, here would be the probability curves of each of these individual securities. Um, what I want to do is combine these into um, my portfolio, and I want to gauge this, the expected return and the standard deviation of the portfolios given the different um, the different numbers for um, for each security. So the last thing I want to do is I got to I got to consider the correlation between the two. So actually, there's my four moments, right? The expected return, standard deviation, um, skewer kurtosis. We said is zero in these. These are normal distributions, and my correlations between all the securities. So here's a little correlation table. Um, calculating my expected return of the portfolio is very easy. It's just the weighted average of the security. So here you're at 5.83. Uh, calculating the standard deviation of my portfolio. It's a little bit more difficult. It requires this big, long formula. Um, you can see I'm not going to annotate anymore on here because that seemed to cause some problems. But um, you can see it's got the weight of the security, the standard deviation of each security, and then the correlation. So it's taking these, these parameters into account. It's a big, long formula. This is just for three securities. If you had 20 securities, this formula probably would be too big to put on the screen. Um, and I can get a standard deviation of 9.79%. So this isn't, again, with Excel and technology, it's not hard to uh, to calculate the standard deviation of, of portfolios. Um, Excel models can handle this type of stuff very easily. So now I have a 5.83 for expected return and 9.79 standard deviation. <clears throat> what I would point attention to is that the 9.79 standard deviation is actually lower than the weighted average of the individual securities. Um, and that's because of the correlations. You can see these correlations here. Um, security A with security C especially are negative. So that tends to reduce the uh, standard deviation of a portfolio. 
or when we say reduce the risk of a portfolio having negatively uh, correlated securities. So um, let me back up one second. This, um, this analysis was first pioneered by, by Harry Markowitz in the 1950s. Um, it's been heavily criticized, but I think it's brilliant. Um, it's called Modern Portfolio Theory, and what it does is combines the, um, the securities to gauge not just the expected return, but the risk of a portfolio. Um, one of the reasons this is criticized is because of some of the other things that it's missing, obviously, is the shape of the distribution. It's not accounting for um, uh, securities that might have uh, more upside than downside or more downside than upside, uh, or it's also been criticized for not having the the fat tails, right? A normal distribution doesn't really have a fat tail. It puts very low probabilities on the, the outlier events occurring. And as we've seen, those tend to occur more frequently than a normal distribution uh, would describe. So um, I would sympathize with Mark with this was done in the 50s. Now in the 50s, he didn't have the technology he did today calculating something like this formula. I could do this very easily in Excel in a few seconds, um, even with a large number of securities. I couldn't imagine how long that would have taken if he had a 20 security portfolio to do a formula like this. Um, now we do have technology though, um, something that Palisade is, is helped with a lot, and that's um, what we call Monte Carlo simulation. So I want to give a quick illustration of what Monte Carlo simulation is. Um, here are my two securities. I apologize for the um, for the graphs. I just drew these freehand and they, they don't look very good. But just imagine security A is a security with negative skew. Okay, so I have a, a mean of 100, um, standard deviation of 20, but I also have negative skew there, skewed to the left. Security B is the opposite, skewed to the right. Now, if I want to combine these securities into a portfolio, there's no formula I can use to do that. Like Markowitz created, gave us that formula, here's the answer. I can't do that if I have um, skew and kurtosis that are non-normal in, um, in my securities. So what, uh, what Markowitz didn't have was the ability to do Monte Carlo simulation. So the way we would combine these, let me see if I can annotate on this. Uh, it's going to mess it up again. Um, so let me exit out of here. Sorry about that. If I try to draw on it, it's creating some problems. But imagine it's going to basically, a Monte Carlo simulation is going to sample um, throughout this curve according to these probabilities um, randomly. And it's going to do thousands and thousands of samples. So it might do sample number one, um, security A, we get a value of $115, okay? Security B in that same sample, we get a value of $95. So we combine those, we get a total value of $210, and that would be our portfolio. That's sample number one. Then it runs sample number two. Um, maybe security A is $80, security B is $92, and get a portfolio value. So we're going to run thousands and thousands of these iterations to combine these securities, and that's how we can gauge the potential outcome. So it's almost just stepping through each path um, according to the probabilities of each of the securities outcomes. So if we do that, um, we get the combined product, which is again a probability curve. So you can see here's the mean uh, portfolio of $200, standard deviation of $15, skew and kurtosis. Okay, so we combined the non-normal distributions using Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, so, so now what? Um, I think people probably tend to start tuning out and say, well, right, this is too much statistics, there's risk, you know, it doesn't matter, standard deviation in my portfolio, I don't care. Um, I would make the argument that standard deviation is actually more important than expected return of a portfolio. So now I want to give a real quick example, and this is where I'm going to go to Excel. Let me move this onto my screen. And here's a real basic Excel model. Okay, I have three securities, A, B, and C. There's different ways I can get 30% return over these three years. So I have your one, two, and three. Um, first, let's say I get um, 0%, 0%, and 30% in years one, two, and three, I get my 30% over the three years, but my effective annual return is only 9.14%. My $10,000 portfolio is worth 13,000 at the end of the three years. I could get 50%, 20%, oops, sorry, 50% negative 20%, and then zero. I still got 30% over the three years. However, my effective annual return now, only 6.2%. My portfolio is worth $1,000 less. Um, so you can see, uh, 
having the dispersion matters here, right? Now, let's just do it nice and easy. Let's say 10%, 10%, 10% every year. My portfolio effective annual return, 10%, portfolio value 13,300. Over three years, I got 30% in all three scenarios. Um, my portfolio C has a higher value. The only difference here is the standard deviation of returns, right? Um, standard deviation is very important when you're managing investments. So um, let me close this example out and give another example. Um, I have my portfolio, standard deviation of 15. Um, I can also assess the performance now. So um, I need to take my return not into consideration by itself, but just um, not just by itself, but with the amount of risk I took to get that. So in portfolio management, the goal isn't necessarily to maximize your return. The goal is to maximize the return for the amount of risk that's being incurred, which would be risk as the standard deviation. Um, alternatively, you could say minimize the risk for the amount of return that was received. So if I have two portfolios, one of them earns 10%, um, the other earns 10% as well. One of them had a 10% standard deviation and the other had a 5%. I would much rather have gotten my 10% with only a 5% standard deviation than 10%. So the goal of portfolio management, again, maximize the return considering the risk. The risk and return are not um, independent of each other. Okay, this graph here is a, um, what we call an efficient frontier. So it basically graphs out the different potential returns given levels of risk that are being incurred. Okay, so start at 2%, we think we can get a 3.5% return. Uh, it goes up as you take more risk. Now, I think that's a common mistake in finance is to assume that by taking more risk, you're going to get more return. That's not how it works. But um, you could say by taking more risk, you should be expecting to get more return. So I want to give a couple examples now. And people who are uh, looking forward to seeing some models, I'm going to finally get into some some uh, some demonstrations. So um, first is let me show um, a model. I'm going to pull it up here that um, that will show how standard deviation impacts the expected outcome or impacts people, uh, an investor trying to achieve their goal. So let's start with, we have scenario number one, we have $500,000, we want to retire in 30 years and we think we need a million dollars to retire. Okay, so I'm gonna pull Excel up here and here's a model that would describe this situation. Okay, I have $500,000 is my current balance. I have uh, an expected return of 5%. And my goal is to get to a million dollars. So you can see <clears throat> I have no dispersion of returns, right? Um, my top 95% is equal to my bottom 95%. This model describes the per portfolio performance. Um, and you can see this is basically just $500,000 growing at 5% a year, uh, net of fees of 1%. And you very easily get to a million dollars. If I were annotating, I could draw a line right here across a million dollars, and it very easily clears it. Um, that's not necessarily what's going to happen. Life doesn't always grow up to the right in a nice straight line. Um, what happens is there's dispersion. So if we change our standard deviation, let's say to 10%, and now we want to run a simulation to gauge the potential outcomes. So 5% expected return, we get a nice even line. We easily get a million dollars. If we run our simulation, um, now we see that we don't necessarily, we aren't necessarily guaranteed of getting to uh, a million dollars if we have a portfolio with a 5% expected return and a 10% standard deviation of return. So as an investment advisor, if I had this client and they said, well, look, not getting to a million dollars is just not acceptable to us. We have to get to a million dollars. I would say, well, you probably need to be taking less standard deviation in your portfolio, taking less risk, right? Um, here is my bottom 95, my bottom 5% of outcome, as you can see, 613,000 is the value at uh, at the end of that. So um, we don't quite get there. Now, if I run the same thing with a 5% standard deviation, let's run a simulation again. This is running a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, we can see that even in the worst scenarios, we just about get to a million dollars. We're about $2,000 short. So, so 
as a um, as an investment advisor, if I'm talking to the client, I say, well, you really can only take five uh, percent standard deviation returns if you're receiving a five percent expected return. So, using this to zero in on the client's goals is um, is very important. Okay, so let's make it <clears throat> a little bit more uh, complicated now. We'll use um, another example, and we have um, somebody who wants to retire. We're not sure how much we we need to retire. So in that last example, the uh, the client knew they thought they needed a million dollars to retire. That was the, the objective. Um, now we just say, well, look, we have five hundred thousand dollars today. Um, we want to retire in thirty years, but we don't know if we have enough to do that. Um, we're going to contribute $17,500 every year until December of 23. And then after that, we're going to distribute $60,000 a year to live off of in retirement. So now our goal is to um, invest this so that the, the client does not run out of money at the end of the 30 years. So um, same thing. We enter those parameters into our model. If you look down at the model, you can see here's my contributions until 2023, then I start distributing $60,000 a year. My goal is to see if I have enough money to get to retirement. If I run it at a 5% standard deviation, let's see if we have enough. Um, the mean case, yes, we have enough money to get to retirement. Um, however, if the worst 5% of outcomes were to occur, you can see they go negative. That's that red line right there. So, so they do not have enough. So, a five percent standard deviation in their portfolio probably isn't acceptable. Um, so that's how this this type of analysis can be used to help um, help individuals or institutions achieve their goal. Another example I had on this screen was um, was an institution who distributes five percent out of their portfolio every year. I'm not, I'm not. I don't think I'm gonna have time to go through that, but it's the same type of analysis. Um, if they are paying out 5% every year, maybe as an endowment for scholarships or, or pensions or something like that, um, will they have enough money to stay endowed um, given the range of potential or the uncertain range of potential outcomes in their investment portfolio? So, so that's a, a good analysis to, to do. It's a very quick, easy model. Um, now, a more complicated model is a financial plan. So I can do financial planning for clients. There's um, there's a lot more uh, uncertain items than just um, the ones described here, right? So if I'm thinking about uh, an individual's life, so what we would do a financial plan, um, income, how much money they're going to be making over the next 20, 30 years, there's a lot of uncertainty there, or your spouse's income. Here's a, a screenshot of a model that um, this is a cutout from my financial planning model um, that basically shows <clears throat> the uh, – the income projections of, uh, of an individual. Now you can see the uncertainty, sorry about that. You can see the uncertainty um, in the potential outcomes. You can also see they contribute to 401ks and stuff like that. All that has to be accounted for. If you're, if you're making uh, um, $100,000 a year and you contribute 4% to your 401k, that contribution amount is going to be different as, you, as your income level changes. So that, that all has to, to tie out. Um, Living expenses, medical expenses, education, uh, personal residence. Here's another um, cutout of, of the financial planning model for residence. Interest rates are the uncertainties here. Inflation, um, all these things should be accounted for um, in the financial planning model. Here's the inflation projections, um, interest rate projections. Um, you can see, again, the dispersion of potential outcomes in all these scenarios. Um, all these things are uncertain and uh, can be run in a financial planning model. I don't have enough time, it's not really like to open this model up and show you, but here's a cutout of it. Um, the two outputs I, I like to look at are the projected net worth, which is pretty self-explanatory. What is the client's net worth going to be um, at the end of the investment horizon or at the end of the model, um, or how does it change? Also, the probability of cash shortfall. So this is a very important one, right? It's am I going to run out of money if I retire, if I do the certain things I want to do? Um, this model right here basically takes the excess cash, so whether it's positive or negative. If it's positive, they contribute it to their portfolios. If it's negative, they're distributing it from their portfolios. And it should be a zero balance every year. So you can see on this 
expanded version, cash balance is zero in most years. Now, if I run the Monte Carlo simulation, um, there's actually the potential that there's some shortfall based on um, maybe the downside events of all these independent variables. So um, you can see my shortfall here um, starts in as early as, I guess, 25 years out. There's a small, very small chance that they can run out of money. Um, it increases significantly, and by the end of this investment horizon, I would actually tell that client, look, the chances are you are going to run out of money by the end of this investment horizon. So that's kind of the outputs of, of a financial planning model. Um, again, it looks like I want to make sure I leave time for questions, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to open up any more models, even though I love doing that stuff. Um, if you have interest in that, please just contact me and we can do future webcasts. Um, I, I love to go through this and share it. So direct investments are um, businesses. If you own a business, if you uh, own commercial real estate, if you own anything else, hotels, timber, farmland, real estate, rental properties, um, all these things have uncertainty in, their, uh, in, in certain variables throughout these investments. So what I do is if you have, let's say, a rental property is probably the easiest one to understand. Um, you can go through that rental property and make some assumptions about the uncertain variables. So, for example, rent rate. I have a, a home. I'm renting it out for $1,000 a month, but that's not a certain number. The next lease could be for $800 a month. It could be for $1,200 a month. Um, I want to account for those uncertainties in, the, in that rental property. So now taking that rental property and those uncertainties, understanding them and how they impact the cash output of that investment should be translated into a financial plan of an individual. Um, a rental property is no different than a stock or a bond, in my opinion. It's an investment, and it should be described by a probability curve of expected returns. Um, okay, real quick, I want to talk about some of the limitations here. Uh, this is important. The first is model error. If your models mess up, then you're going to have mistakes. That's obvious. Um, a couple of the, the pu pushback items I get are, um, <clears throat> well, what if your assumptions are wrong? And I say, well, if your assumptions are wrong, you're not going to get a good result. It's garbage in, garbage out. Um, taking the time to understand the inputs is very important, and that's uh, where I spend a lot of my time. So um, garbage in, garbage out, yes, it is garbage in, garbage out. Um, fat tails. A lot of people are concerned about fat tails. It was a catchphrase after, you know, the, the financial downturn, financial crisis. Oh, we didn't account for the fat tails. Well, um, that's nobody else's fault except the people who aren't accounting for them. A fat tail can be described in a probability distribution. So um, if I wanted to have fat tails on my probability curves, I would change the shape of that probability curve. I'd change those statistical parameters to give that uh, curve fat tails. So that's, uh, I guess, under the garbage in, garbage out. If you want to have it, account for fat tails and put fat tails in there. Um, one of the other limitations is that um, I tend to look at the 95th percentile of outcomes. So two standard deviations or five to 95 percentile outcomes. Um, when, when you show that to people, the, the gut reaction is, okay, this is guaranteed. Um, a 95th percent chance or 95 percent chance is still not guaranteed. A 99 percent chance isn't guaranteed. In fact, a three standard deviation event is a 99.7 percent probability of, uh, I'm sorry, or 0.3 percent probability of occurrence. Um, that's very low, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. In fact, it still happens. It, it can happen if you live for 100 years. Chances are it's going to happen. Um, in fact, most of the time it happens more frequently than that. So um, I think a mistake would be to take a confidence interval, 5 to 95 percentile, and assume that you're safe, that it's not going to go outside of that. It can, in fact, I would say it will go outside of that at some point. Um, the last is that markets are constantly changing. So um, defining the probability curve of a security um, is difficult in and of itself. I'll do a separate webcast on that if people want to see that. But um, but now taking the fact that stock prices change every day, okay? So I, I have a stock that's $100, um, or security prices change every day. If I have a stock that's $100, um, and I say, okay, here's my probability curve of the expected outcomes. Um, now the stock goes from $100 to $70. 
it's completely changed the shape of that probability curve. I have to redo that analysis, right? So, um, in fact, if it goes from $100 to $101 or $100.01 even, that probability curve, the, the potential outcomes have changed as that, as that security price has changed. Now, that makes it difficult, and it's, it's often a limiting factor when people try to apply this type of analysis. So I can show how I do that as well, um, probably on, on a future call. So um, summary, give the highest probability. I think every investment, try to think of it as a set of statistical assumptions, and that's it. And it definitely helps with removing the emotion out of investing. Um, understand those statistical assumptions, how they apply, how they fit your financial objective. Um, before you invest is my recommendation. So um, that's it, and now I can open it up to questions. Excellent, thank you, Matt. There are some great analogies in this webcast, and we really appreciate it. This is, uh, okay. yeah, this, uh, I learned quite a bit. I, I appreciate that too, and, and my wife will appreciate that too when I bring home some advice that, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, retirement funds don't continue to go up in smoke. <laughs> um, uh, do we have any questions out there? We may have one. It's, it's actually in our, uh, our uh, Q&A panel, so I might have to – I'll switch in a second. Uh, we do have one, one question. Can we have the slides of the presentation? I think uh, – uh is this sure, the, do we have a version of this archived on our, our website already, too? I can send out a – from the Vegas uh, presentation? I, I, I believe the presentation I gave at the conference in November is probably archived on your um, – Oh, yes. On your site, but this is a different one, um, more designed for a webcast to hopefully integrate some of the models and stuff. Um, I can send – I can send the uh, – yeah, I can certainly send the slides to this, and you guys can put those up as well. Oh, great. Oh, great. Oh, and I'm, I have a question. Can, can we look at – you had a, one slide that had these two interesting distributions on it, and I, I just wanted to hear a little more about those two. Uh, I was unfamiliar with them. I'm sorry, which ones? Oh, there was a slide, and it had two – it was a slide a ways back, and it had these two really interesting distributions on them, the ones that you use. Let's see. This? Oh, no, a little bit further back. These, maybe? Yeah, the one, maybe. Oh, one more ahead of that, too. Uh, hmm, oh, so uh, now we're back off of you. ahead of that, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll just click oh. here and tell me. <laughs> Those two on the slide right before this one. Sorry. Yeah. So these are yes. these are just these are just distributions designed to show non-normality. So um, positive skew, negative skew, um, and basically incorporating skew and kurtosis into the analysis. So um, again, here the, the excess and kurtosis is leptokuric and platykuric. So that's what these are. Great. Right. Um, yeah. I do see a question up here. If I have a standard deviation mean and probability for the price of a share, can I use those as inputs to forecast the return? So, so that's a great point, a uh, great question is, um, I think what you're asking is, if, I've, if I look at how these parameters were calculated uh, over the history of the security, can I use these going forward? Um, I would say absolutely not. Um, the historical returns of a security, um, I believe have no predictive value. Um, in fact, that's usually in the disclaimers that we have to. Yeah, I should have pointed that out. But historical um, returns aren't um, a predictor of future returns. So, so the challenge uh, is really to to come up with these same parameters, um, but you want to do it on a forward-looking basis. So, how do I calculate the expected return, standard deviation, skew, kurtosis, correlations? Um, of my security, but going what I think they're going to be in the future, not what they were in the past. Uh, what they were in the past, it could be drastically different in the future from what they were in the past. And they always change, so in fact, they will be different. Um, hopefully that, that answers that question. Great. Now, uh, we have a – both of us can't see a Q&A panel. We only see the chat panel. 
but I think we have a few questions on the, the Q&A panel. So what I'll do is I'm just going to open that up just for a second. And then, it, Matt, if you need the presenter ball again, I can pass that right back to you. I see our, our panel right there. Let's see what we have here. Ah, I see. So Q and A panel. Can I go ahead and answer some of these? Yes, that would be great. Do you use optimization to find out a person's allocation? A person's allocation. How often do you typically recommend a rebalance for a great question? Uh, yeah, the efficient frontier curve that I showed. So that was that graph going up of um, expected return versus the risk incurred. Um, that is that is. Uh, assembled, or I guess the data for that comes as the product of an optimization. So so basically you're comparing um, thousands of um, thousands of possible portfolios um, to figure out which ones give you the best risk return trade-off. Um, to do that requires an optimization. You could, uh, and then how often do I typically do that? So, um, you know, I, I tend to stick with my assumptions unless there's some reason to have it changed. So I, I set my capital market expectations for a security. Um, unless there's a significant event that would say, oh, I need to revise this, I leave them because I, I don't change them just based on the movement of that security. Um, that's the nature of the, uh, of the distributions, right, is that the price is going to fluctuate within those um, parameters, and I expect that it will. Um, so to answer your question about optimization now, I, I run my optimization once I set the capital market expectations for security. If I need to revise <clears throat> those capital market expectations, um, then I would then I would also revise, then I'd redo the optimizations, right, because now I have a new set of data. So, um, so I think it would be a mistake to say, okay, let me set my parameters for security, and now um, I have those, the price fell 10% over the last, you know, month, oh, holy cow, I got to revise all these, right? Now I got to change my capital market. So I don't know why you would unless there was an actual event, maybe something happened with the company or the economy that you're saying, oh, okay, this is going to impact throughout these. I need to revise them. Then, then I would understand that. But just based on the price movements, I don't do that. So because of that, it tends I don't have to run these optimizations all the time. I wait until um, something is, is set. Another point I would make is the optimizations, um, involve a lot of constraints. So when you run an optimization, again, something I do future webcasts on, but there's, you, you have to um, specify a, a lot of constraints. So what is the standard deviation you're trying to target? Um, what are the weights that you have min and max of the different securities? And, um, and doing that is, is a little bit of an art and a science as well. Um, you typically want to do that for the different types of investors. So if I had a client who, say, um, had direct investments in theirs, then my constraints are going to be different than a client who may be only allowed for certain ETFs in their portfolios. So hopefully that uh, that answers that question. Do we have a little bit more time, or can we answer some more? Oh, sure. You could uh, – sure. Okay, so let's see. Can you, can you discuss how you calculate the various expected return distribution curves? Yeah, that's going to be a topic for a future webcast. So I, I would love to do that. Um, but basically, you, you have to look at the uh, properties of that security. So, or if it's a direct investment, the properties of that, right? So, I mean, if um, if I have a security that's impacted by um, by GDP in the U.S., I got to I, I want to um, estimate. The, the parameters of GDP or interest rates or, or whatever these variables are called multi multi factor models is what I use to do that um, and so it, it, it's really different for almost every single I would say at least every asset class or sub asset class you're going to be looking at different factors um, so that's a great question I, I would love to show some of those maybe in the future um, let's see how do we get the standard deviation of real estate office buildings in Denver same same uh, same point, right? So if I, I'm not necessarily going to say, okay, security or real estate, an office building in Denver is going to trade with a standard deviation like a stock place does, right? But um, I can set estimations, right? I used to work in commercial real estate, and you know, I would, what I would do is go talk to our leasing rep and say, hey, look, you got you have this space right here, okay? 
um, tell me what is the asking rent rate for this space? And, okay, fifteen dollars a square foot. All right, great. With uh, modified gross and certain assumptions, right? Okay, well, um, fifteen dollars is probably not what you're going to get. Maybe it is. What, what what do you think you could? What could that range be, right? Okay, well, we think you know we could get it thirteen. We might have to do thirteen. We could get up to seventeen a foot, right? So so those things change. Now, as I define those, that that dispersion is is basically calculating my standard deviation of those variables for me, right? So, so with the real estate and office, again, it's not going to trade like a stock, but there will be a calculated standard deviation based on, when I say the dispersion of those, uh, those multi-factors, those, those independent variables within that asset. Um, so great question on that one. And that requires a lot of modeling, right? My, my, um, the commercial real estate models are very, very complex because, um, if you get uh, $17 a foot, well, you probably had to give up some concession, right? So now you have a correlation between the um, the asking rate or the, the effective rent rate you get plus the um, the concessions you had to give up to give that, maybe some free rent, maybe some stuff like that. So, um, I mean, you do TI or leasing, uh, you know, commissions were paid differently in order to affect that rent. So, so those can get very complicated, especially with office. Office is probably the most complicated of them all. Um, so good question. Um, let's see, are there fat tail distributions that are ready to use in at-risk? Yeah, great question. At-risk has um, a number of distributions predefined. Um, I'm probably not the expert on, on all of those, so I, I couldn't recommend one um, right off my head, but there's, when you use at-risk, you can go in and say define distribution. Um, it'll let you choose any one of those and I'm sure the probabilities in the tails of those, so you can, you can select one that you think has the appropriate fatness in the tail. I don't know if that's the right way to say that, but, but that answers your question. Um, the last one up here, and I apologize I'm running over, is how do we select simultaneous points in the fat tails using Monte Carlo might be uh, useful of all. So here's what I know of it, is I run um, a Monte Carlo engine through at risk that uses what you call the Latin hypercube method for sampling. So Basically, it's breaking those um, tails into quadrants to make sure that it's sampling in the tails. Um, that's very important because if you have a five standard deviation event, I think the chance of that occurrence is one in like 1.7 million. So I don't want to have to run 1.7 million iterations in order to make sure I've sampled uh, my tails in my distribution function. So um, I, I believe it's called a Latin hypercube sampling method. That basically will systematically test the tails to make sure that all parts of the distribution do get sampled um, with their associated probabilities, even though that might be very, very rare. So hopefully uh, that answers that answers the question you were you were getting at. Um, I think that's it. Is there anything else, yeah. that, James? I th I, th I think that's it for. For now, if you have any other questions that we've missed or they occur to you uh, in uh, after this presentation, or if you're watching the recording of this presentation sometime in the future, please reach out to us. Uh, Matt's email is in the presentation, and my email, I'll, I'll reach out to all of you. And uh, I'd like to thank Matt very much for, for providing this, and I want to thank everybody for coming. Great. Thank you, Jameson. And thank you, everybody. And thanks, Matt. <laughs>